Hi, and welcome to our first Animal All Week event of the 2022 season. My name is Kristen Stills. I'm a professor here and faculty director of the Animal Law and Policy Program, which as of the fall, uh, thanks to the Brooks Institute, has been endowed and renamed the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard. So I am pleased and honored to introduce our first speaker of this week's series. Uh, Manisha Decca will be our first, our first speaker speaking on animals as legal beings contesting anthropocentric legal orders. Uh, Manisha is my friend and colleague and one of the most creative and impactful scholars and thinkers in this field today. She is a professor at the University of Victoria School of Law and where she holds the Lansdowne Chair in Law. She also directs and founded the Animals and Society Research Initiative, which does super creative things like producing a documentary now, holding writing groups for graduate, graduate students and other really creative kinds of events. Um, Professor Decca's research interests include animal legal studies and critical animal studies, feminist animal care theory, and feminist analysis of law, sociolegal studies in general, and reproductive end of life ethics. Uh, she has published widely, and I encourage you to look at her website for some fascinating titles, but I also wanna really emphasize that her scholarship has been featured in non-academic spaces, as well as the, such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York and on CBC Radio One. Um, whenever you leave a conversation with Manisha, you have so much to think about. She's a vast and creative thinker, and we are extremely happy that she'll be here talking today on Animals as Legal Beings, which is related to a book she has recently published. Uh, you can type your questions in at any time during her talk, and at the end, Chris Green, our executive director, will field them, and Professor Decca will, uh, will be kind enough to take some time to answer them. So with that, welcome virtually to the program and to Animal Law Week, Manisha. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Kristen, for that this lovely, generous um, introduction. And thank you everyone at um, Harvard for this um, wonderful invitation. I'm so honored to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I also just want to start off, so hopefully everyone's seeing the cover slide there, Animals as Legal Beings, Contesting Anthropocentric Legal Orders. And I wanted to also start off by just acknowledging with respect the human territories of the Ligwangwin peoples on whose territories my university, the University of Victoria resides, and to acknowledge that the relationships that the Songhees, Esquimalt, and the Sanish peoples that they have to the territory territory is really profound and continues today. I think, you know, these um, territorial acknowledgements are also an opportunity to recognize, you know, the non-human um, indigenous inhabitants of the land as well. And really just to take a moment to dwell on the fact that the processes of colonialism are so informed by anthropocentrism. And so kind of seeing that connection between colonialism and anthropocentrism and really among different interhuman hierarchies and anthropocentrism has been like a staple of my work and my approach to um, thinking about animal law and very much um, uh, kind of uh, grounds the current book project. So what I'd like to do in the time today is to just convey to you, share with you the main argument of the book to point out um, you know, how it might be different and how I would, I would argue it is different than kind of most approaches uh, to animal law and thinking about the status of legal animals, um, at least in Anglo-American circles. So I'll just briefly go over some of the purposes and departure points in the book from the introduction and then talk about the main points of part one and then the main points of part two, which is where I develop this new legal status for animals that I'm calling legal beingness, and then spend some time on the conclusion where I outline some kind of preliminary first steps toward change. Okay, so purposes and departure points. On the um, first column, in the first column under purposes, 
there are really just two. You know, the main one was number one, to theorize a new transformative legal subjectivity for animals. Um, so really kind of taking issue with the property classification for animals and then kind of exploring what would be a better transformative subjectivity that you know, decommodifies animals. And then a secondary purpose related to that was to kind of bring critical theory, like for example, feminist theory or um, post-colonial, anti-colonial, decolonial theory, um, post-structuralist theory, even disability studies, to kind of bring this um, you know, body of knowledge and literature that is kind of so well um, harnessed by many sociolegal scholars in dealing with um, what are seen to be just kind of human issues, human social problems, to kind of mine that theory and put it in conversation with animal law conversations, which are, um, you know, traditionally housed in kind of liberalism and not um, engaging too much with the aforementioned critical theory. So this is my own academic background in um, terms of my kind of undergraduate years and then continued, you know, for into law school and graduate school and then um, just my writing and teaching thereafter, really to kind of meld feminist theory, anti-colonial theory, post-colonial theory with animal issues. So that's related then to the departure points on the right side, the second column. Um, there are many that I go over in the introduction. We'll just you know go over three here first. That you know I acknowledge that law is still invariably going to be anthropocentric. Anything we humans do is going to be anthropocentric. And so from you know, the perspectives of animals can still very much be seen to be like a colonizing um, uh, move or gesture. And so not without its problems, um, however benignly intentioned. Yet I would say it's still worth engaging um, the idea of law reform and thinking differently about animals and you know, hoping for change. Um, point two is that the primary focus of the book is to take aim at um, legal orders that are really defined by human exceptionalism. And so this is just, you know, to acknowledge that there are multiple legal orders throughout the world. Um, in Canada, you know, our, our kind of colonial legal orders, for example, as an example, we have the common law, we also have the civil law, uh, primarily in Quebec, um, but we also have indigenous legal orders, uh, which I think many people would argue is quite less anthropocentric, right, than the common law. So this book uh, really focuses on the common law. And then third, I'm using the word animal or sometimes non-human animal like I do in the book. Um, but of course, I'm you know, aware of the debate about what is appropriate terminology and the fact that the words we use matter in terms of shaping our even understanding of social problems, let alone the resolutions. Um, so uh, I use it as a shorthand because I don't have something better to offer at this point. Okay, so part one is where I um, argue in chapter one that you know property is not a good subjectivity for animals; it enables their exploitation. So really, you know, my entry into this whole field was when I was a law student and I read Professor Gary Francione's *Animals, Property, and the Law*. Um, 1995 book uh, out of Rutgers, where, or so he's at Rutgers, University of Pennsylvania Press, where, as you may know, he canvasses, um, you know, all 50 American jurisdictions to look at the operation of anti-cruelty statutes. And, you know, here is one area of the law that we think might be protective of animals. And so he does a deep dive to see, you know, what, what do these statutes really protect? And his conclusion is not much. It's really just the socially aberrant um, behavior, not anything to do with um, what's considered mainstream or, or, or normal or legitimate um, industry. And so um, I took a look at Canadian jurisprudence in this area, basically reaching the same conclusion. Also kind of um, building on previous uh, work that I've done about how the anti cruelty statutes really map on to kind of um, racialized and classed ideas of what are, you know, proper ways of dealing with animals or proper uses, um, and not just um, only about, uh, you know, what is mainstream in a society um, thought of without or not in relation to social difference. But all of that to say, yes, property is not an animal friendly uh, category. And so then 
you know, those of us kind of exposed to animal law understand basically what that main argument here is that property is, you know, subordinating. And then we also understand that the usual kind of then, you know, corrective for property is personhood. That let's get legal personhood for animals. Let's get courts and legislatures to see animals as persons. So chapter two is where I probably make the most provocative argument in the book for animal law scholars and practitioners to say that actually there are problems with personhood. So I'm going to spend some time, a bit more time on explaining that argument. And I'll just know that chapter three is a chapter that acknowledges that there are you know, more foundations to the common law that are anthropocentric than just the subjectivity that is chosen. For example, um, the demotion of emotions or you know, the pejorative kind of um, views of emotions and uh, the insistence that reason is a, is a and, and reasoning, legal reasoning is an emotions free process, for example. So chapter three deals with, you know, some of those other kind of changes that would be good to see in the law. But let's just focus on chapter two, what's wrong with personhood? So as a lot of critical theory, like feminist theory, disability um, studies has talked about post-cultural theory, certainly, we, um, you know, when we think of personhood, we typically have this rationalist type of person in mind. Now, legal personhood scholars have shown, like across multiple common law jurisdictions, um, the United States and Canada included, um, that there are actually several different iterations of personhood. There's, it's actually, despite its foundational status to the law, not talked about so much. And when it is, it's not a kind of uniform even coherent um, uh, conversation about what personhood is. But um, we can, you know, relying on Nagar Nafim's work, look at a topology that, you know, identifies three types. First, this idea of an empty vessel kind of, you know, repository for anything. So that's what lets corporations be personhood. It's not human specific. A person who's ever um, the law deems to be a person, whether it's a court saying that or, you know, a statute saying that. A second common way that jurists talk about personhood that judges do or that other legal actors do is kind of, you know, um, sacred, almost sacred, dignity, human dignity version of personhood, um, which pops up a lot in um, contestations over um, abortion and fetal life, embryonic life, for example, or the rights of the dead about who is a person, um, is it just a living human outside a body, uh, a woman's body, or is it someone who is living still and not dead? Okay, but there's also a third iteration of personhood called the rationalist personhood, uh, vision of personhood in this topology. And this is the vision of personhood that says a person is someone who can reason to a certain level, is autonomous, is independent, and really is a economic self-maximizer. And even though there are other um, iterations of personhood, like the empty vessel, the kind of more sacred um, uh, vision, the rationalist pers uh, personhood vision actually enacts um, a lot of influence on those other visions, such that it can you know, be seen as to be like um, a quite a dominant vision of personhood. All right, so what is wrong with this rationalist vision of personhood for animals? Well, um, it's a very exclusive and exclusionary kind of um, concept to say that one only matters and counts as a legal person if you can reason to a certain extent. So critical theorists have criticized this vision of personhood, you know, outside of thinking about animals just for a marginalized human group, saying that this is a very gendered, this is a very class, able-bodied kind of race perspective of you know, who is a paradigmatic human, what it means to be human. And actually we don't hear a lot about the body such that all humans that are kind of associated with the body through the, um, enlight Western enlightenment thinking, Cartesian dualisms, you know, the mind versus the body, men versus women, and civilizational narratives about which cultures are, you know, more of the mind and more of the body. This doesn't bode well. So if you think of that critique and relate it to animals, as I do in the book, we can see that, you know, animals are you know, beings that um, Western traditions have animalized, right? So that means they are just associated with their bodies. They're not seen to be rational at all, even though we can easily make arguments for many species that there are. So 
um, in this chapter, I argue that it doesn't make sense to take personhood and apply it to animals because we're always gonna to have to contend in our arguments with this rationalist vision about who counts. And invariably some animals are never going to be seen to be rational enough meaning they're never gonna be seen to be human enough, right? So there's this like this tether pulling us back always to human benchmarks uh, um, when we argue for animals. And one further argument that I make in the book is I'm drawing on others uh, work. Um, for example, David Delaney and his um, uh, book, Law and Nature is to think about, you know, the person property split in the common law it's actually constructed through the human animal split in wider cultural thinking, such that to take animals out of their property status and kind of elevate them to the personhood status really is just, you know, nonsensical. It doesn't make sense because the idea of the person is so informed by what is not animal. And uh, invariably, this status will be assimilationist and humanizing. Um, and at the end of the chapter, I say, you know what, maybe I'm wrong with respect to all those arguments I've just advanced and um, personhood, you know, actually can be recuperated um, again, you know, um, to something that's animal friendly. But then I say, you know what, we're at a point where we're trying to, you know, still make some inroads for animals away from their property status. It's not like animals are already seen to be legal persons and I'm saying, you know, let's claw back that status and inject a new one. So in another way, uh, what I'm trying to say is that there's not too much to lose by starting from the ground up and theorizing a different status for animals that is more, you know, respectful of their alterity and their difference from humans rather than kind of personhood, which carries that baggage of, trying to show why animals fit into human benchmarks of who is a person that are now quite long-standing. So that's the main argument against personhood and you know the argument to push for something else that is more respectful of animal differences. Now having said all that, I want to acknowledge um, the work by many animal organizations of which the Non-Human Rights Project is just one notable influential one, especially in the United States, uh, that there's you know, lots of interesting good animal work that asks for court and a legislative recognition of animal personhood. And I'm not, you know, this is kind of a discourse that is growing, not just in legal circles, even though you know, there are not too many wins or of uh, a systemic nature at all, but also just kind of generally out in you know, the cultural space that we inhabit in our, in our day to day. So this actually is a photo I took from a panel at our local um, Capitol Museum, the Royal British Columbia Museum, which currently has an exhibit on orcas. And um, there's one panel after you go through you know, probably about 90% of the exhibit where you know we're, we see kind of the first um, uh, few sentences here give an idea of the message. The panel says, you know, legally captive orcas are property, but even in the wild, orcas' fates are deter determined by our laws. To have rights in most countries, an orca would have to be declared a person. And if we read further, and if you kind of, you know, go through the museum exhibit and get the full gist of, of the messages, it's, you know, arguably a space where the legal personhood of orcas is being promoted and the captivity is seen as now a present day wrong against orcas. And in Canada, actually, as in some other jurisdictions, in 2019, we now have a law which is called, as you can see, Ending the Captivity of Whales and Dolphins Act. And so in, from one perspective, this is like such an amazing groundbreaking piece of legislation at the federal level because it bans the future kind of taking into captivity of whales and dolphins. It bans breeding of any current captive um, cetaceans um, uh, of which there are some, the Vancouver Aquarium and also in Southwestern Ontario and Marineland. Um, and so as one kind of uh, oppositional um, member of parliament noted in the debates leading up to the passing, uh, you know, 
This is the first time that Canada has ever said it's wrong to keep an animal in captivity. So certainly uh, from one perspective, groundbreaking legislation, and although there's nothing in this legislation that says orcas are persons, the whole kind of argumentation that supported the passing of this bill was about their intelligence, um, uh, the harms of captivity for such intelligent and social animals. And just that, you know, they're kind of this type of megafauna that humans are in, um, enraptured with and captivated by and shouldn't be in captivity. So, you know, a strong personhood undercurrent supporting the legislation. Okay, so definitely we can understand um, the kind of litigation and law reform projects that ask for person for animals, but you will note, no doubt, a pattern in those previous examples of, right, gorillas, chimpanzees, other non-human primates, orcas, um, even elephants, these are invariably the humanized animals um, in our kind of dominant cultures, and we are not seeing, you know, widespread campaigns for the farmed animals for obvious strategic reasons um, with respect to personhood. And it's not clear based on my argument chapter two that personhood, even if um, extended to the humanized animals like orcas and chimpanzees um, is going to extend to those animals that mainstream society doesn't see as human enough or humanizable, especially because we eat them or many people eat them. Okay, so that's why I advocate for a different legal status. Um, and it's part two where I develop this argument. And so part two contains chapter four called Beingness, a new legal subjectivity for animals, where I lay out the um, subjectivity of beingness and, and what you know, comprises it. And chapter five is when I can you know, engage some critiques of the argument thus far. So let me just go over both. So this slide, chapter four, kind of, you know, um, represents in a real, you know, nut nutshell, the entire argument about personhood and its problems and beingness and, you know, kind of its uh, potential for animals. So if we understand the three traits under each um, subjectivity as being definitive or, um, you know, very central to that subjectivity, we can see the difference between what personhood is kind of valuing in a being and what it's um, telling us about that being and why they're valuable, for example, um, and what beingness is saying as an alternative or instead. So if personhood is about, you know, being disembodied, about just really, you know, wanting to know if someone has the requisite cognitive ability to be a rational person acting independently so that their autonomy is assured. Beingness is a juxtaposition to each of that. Instead of valuing disembodiment, it is very much kind of valuing embodiment of a particular being um, and respecting the physical and also psychological pain and suffering that can flow from embodiment when we are kind of thwarted in you know, uh, what we would like to do with our bodies and subject to the purposes of, of others who may harm us. Same thing with relational. So beingness is a legal, legal subjectivity that's meant to turn our minds to kind of the relational nature of ourselves, rather than valuing again, this feature of being independently autonomous, relationality is a value that says, nobody is really independently autonomous. We certainly aren't as babies, right? Human babies, and many of us may not be, you know, going through our lives or at the end of our lives. And so, beingness would value not just embodiment but relationality how we are connected to our families and to wider communities so then the harms of being disconnected from our families and those wider communities can then come into view and then finally um, juxtaposed against the rationality that is so prized by personhood beingness really attends to vulnerability the vulnerability that flows from our embodiment, so from you know being subject to pain in different levels, um, and um, to the possible devastation when our relationality is interfered with in ways that we don't want. So these are the three kind of constitutive features of beingness: embodiment, relationality, and vulnerability. And then chapter four, again, I rely on a lot of critical theory 
a, like feminist theory, for example, a lot of it, you know, not really concerned about animals, but showing why these features should matter to ethical theorizing, to legal theorizing. And then I basically say there's nothing to stop such valuations, um, such arguments um, to extend beyond the human to non-humans to value non-human animal embodiment, relationality and vulnerability. Okay, and so then in chapter five, um, the penultimate chapter is where I you know, stop to consider, okay, so thus far, as you may have gleaned, the argument is really much very much um, an attack on liberal humanism, saying that that way of thinking of, you know, who counts morally, ethically, then who should count in law is, you know, just fraught um, with so many kind of discriminatory attitudes and certainly not a good foundation for a legal status like for animals, um, i.e. personhood. Um, uh, so then I pause here to think, well, you know, am I just kind of shifting um, the goalposts or redrawing a line that's actually reinscribing you know, the fundamental tenets of liberal humanism. So in other words, um, or another way to think of this chapter is, you know, what about plants? What about the non-humans that aren't animals that, you know, I'm not extending beingness to? And so um, the reason I say that beingness is, you know, appropriate for animals and not for plants, so this is one of the questions I take up in chapter five, is because I wanna be clear um, that beingness is meant to be as protective a status as personhood um, is theorized to be. So we know, right, all being persons ourselves and knowing what um, the inequalities just among human beings are, that legal personhood is, you know, wonderful formal equality status, but on the ground, um, may be wanting such that it needs to be supplemented by lots of resources from government and, and otherwise. Okay, um, but uh, for, uh, kind of for animals who don't have formal equality, we know that personhood, if it was extended, is coveted for animals because then it's seen to be a shield against the instrumentalization that property um, enables today. So I say plants, as much as they are not properly respected by the common law and are objectified just as much as, or even more so than animals and just treated as resources and, and not really seen for who they are. And here I draw from you know, plant studies scholars um, who talk about the need to see plants much more differently. Um, and also uh, even looking at the work of emergent work of AI theory and robots and what do we owe to these other non-humans, including, you know, non-humans seem to be kind of inanimate or not living in Western cultures, at least like mountains and rivers and rocks. And I say, especially about plants, because human beings and animals will need to eat plants, going forward to continue to subsist and survive. Beingness is not an appropriate category because then it's going to be diluted into what is currently understood as a welfare type of initiative, such that you know, we're being respectful, let's say, but we're still killing something in the end. Um, so uh, chapter five says, the law needs a much more responsive attitude toward plants, but beingness is not appropriate because beingness is supposed to be a full stop against death and torture and other um, exploitation and suffering uh, for animals. So um, another theme in chapter five is that uh, I consider the argument, well, if, um, you know, I've been arguing that rationality is a problem to privilege in the law. What about sentience? Is beingness just about um, recognizing the sentience of animals? And here I also say sentience is not necessary for beingness. So you could have an animal that is not sentient um, that will qualify as a legal being. So I don't want to substitute the premium on rationality with the premium on, sen on sentience. So here again, I'm differing from other animal law scholars. And then you know, I invite you to kind of look at the rest of the kind of more you know, multi-layered argumentation chapter five to understand why I say that. Um, but I'd like to just quickly convey that one takeaway from uh, the final takeaway from chapter five is that um, uh, capacities can still matter in ethical thinking, 
So it's not like whether someone is sentient or whether someone is rational it wouldn't matter to kind of the legal outcome for that particular being. Um, but it would just be a much more nuanced conversation. Okay, and so then finally in the concluding chapter, um, I review, you know, the difference between beingness um, and personhood to say beingness is you know, a corrective to personhood for the four kind of mentioned arguments in the book. And here, you know, because I was invited to by um, my kind of reviewers for the book uh, to talk, you know, more about, you know, beingness was implemented, what would be some first steps to get to this like radically different type of approach to animals? So let me just go over some of those first steps in case you might be wondering as well what they look like. Okay, so I identified three preliminary steps to uh, kind of uh, launch a legal order of beingness for animals. First, most obviously perhaps, there has to be a codification of prohibitions and new legislative principles. Um, step two, we also have to design models for animal-friendly decision-making. And step three, we need to have a legal system that listens to animals to partner with them to discern their needs. Okay, so step one, codification of prohibitions and new legislative principles. Um, so the first would just be, right, a ban on all the ways that um, industries use animals today. So complete prohibition on human or corporate trade in animals. There would have to be new legislative principles of a rejection of human exceptionalism that could be kind of like, you know, an overarching statutory interpretive principle, um, as well as then number three, a commitment to listen to and respond to the needs of vulnerable others. So we see these types of um, kind of valuations or value statements already in our legal system, in preambles to legislation, for example, um, or um, through uh, accreted common law judgments to create kind of a new ethos toward approaching a certain practice. So it's not without precedent in our um, society to do this, uh, in, even in our common law legal order. And we have seen some prohibitions on trade for animals. Um, where the kind of motivation is there. So most recently in British Columbia, because of the evidence about zoonotic diseases and COVID, the coronavirus, uh, mink farming was banned in British Columbia. And of course the mink farmers are, you know, um, uh, suing the government for that recent measure, but there's an example of a prohibition on corporate trade um, and uh, that can be seen as a model for radically restructuring society. And we also know from our recent, you know, last two years, perhaps not so recent, um, with, the, um, with respect to the pandemic and global restructuring that where there's motivation there, we are able to shift quite quickly to a different way of being and governance. Um, we, and uh, at least in some countries uh, where it's been affordable or you know, uh, feasible to kind of take out huge amounts of debt um, and service it later. For example, Canada, there has been supports for people going through um, the transition where everything shut down. So step one, of course, is a radical step, but uh, it's not without pressing again society to do something like that. Okay, so step two is more about how can animals be subjects and not just kind of passive objects um, in a, a, a legal order that's based on beingness? And again, here, there are examples in the common law where we try to attend to the interests of subjects that might not be able to um, communicate their interests to us or at least in ways that we can understand. So if we think of env longstanding environmental law and environmental impact assessments, Certainly there has been critique of these processes and kind of the regulatory capture within them. But yet there are ways to think about attending to non-human interests through and uh, uh, various assessment models. Same thing with number two example, supported decision-making. So we may have heard of substitute decision-making, right? For human beings who are not able to meet um, uh, the uh, legal capacity levels for their own decision-making and need uh, someone else to step in for them on a best interest model or uh, through um, previous requests now honored by their 
substitute decision maker. There's also even what may be seen as a higher standard of respecting that person's um, kind of um, sense of themselves and what they want called supported decision making, where we try to figure out where we, when we can't get a straight answer, what they may want. Okay, and then finally, step three, which uh, is called listening to animals to partner with them to discern their needs. It kind of addresses the question that, you know, at least I often hear, well, how can we know what animals want if we're moving to a legal system where we're trying to integrate them as more subjects rather than objects? You know, how can we listen to them? That seems like a, just, you know, ridiculous. How, how would you be able to listen to animals? I mean, those of us who have, you know, kind of been around um, animals in our lives or are kind of, you know, just immersed in these scholarly areas will know that we can listen to others who may not speak our language, right? So again, just going back to the example of human babies, most human babies do not talk until like they're well into their second year, approaching their third year, and and some may be nonverbal, go, you know, going forward. The, and we also know, but yet we can communicate with them, yet parents communicate with them, caregivers communicate with them all the time. Um, and we also know that just from communication scholars, most of our communication with each other is nonverbal. So the nonverbality um, of animals, if that's how we think of them, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis humans, shouldn't be an impediment to any kind of change for them for the better. We, there is a way to kind of say, okay, we'll never know fully what they want. And we shouldn't, you know, as humans, I wouldn't say, think that we ever would. That's a bit of a hubristic stance, a colonizing stance. But as Laura Gruen has offered in her work on entangled empathy and uh, Josephine Donovan, another feminist animal care theorist in her longstanding body of work, um, and others have talked about intra-species mindfulness. There are ways to kind of practice trying to kind of listen to animals to figure out what they might want. Okay, and then a further example I give of all of this is to think about um, the situation where we might have, you know, animals who start off as property and so are kind of, you know, going through um, the animal agricultural system, but then there's the legal change of beingness. And so now they're, um, you know, one day they're property, but the next day they're beings and there's, they have still survived this system, uh, despite probably all the inbred disabilities and impairments that they have to live with. How can we care for these animals going forward? Because this invariably is gonna be the largest base of animals that we're gonna have. Um, in a being disorder. And so here I just, again, jot out some preliminary steps. I draw on the scholarship of others, Kendra Coulter, otherwise who talked about a shift from animal industries to humane labor. There can be economic supports for all the humans in these industries to shift out. Uh, we can have a regulated system of public and private sanctuaries um, to kind of care for these animals. Where can the costs come? Well, there could be cost recovery from animal use industries. Again, I'll just come back to my home province of what is known as British Columbia. Um, today, British Columbia uh, was the first jurisdiction in going after the tobacco companies for cost recovery for the public health costs of you know, uh, dealing with all um, the healthcare that smoking causes. And uh, we have now other models of kind of asking industries to pay for their negative externalities and there can be a cost recovery model for animals. I recognize this might be more of a of a, a possible kind of tact in some countries over others given kind of public sentiment about property and the constitutional protection of property but um, I think it is possible in a wide variety of jurisdictions. So of course as in closing I'd like to acknowledge that you know, beingness is not around the corner. A person is not around the corner. Beingness is not around the corner for animals. But you know, I think there is some momentum that is building for um, you know either because of growing awareness about climate change or zoonotic diseases um, oh, and extinction loss for some type of shift in society. What can we do in the meantime? Um, as I and others have suggested elsewhere, I think we can continue to bear witness to animals in their various spaces of captivity. And I'll just close with this, uh, how I close in the book, um, with 
this wonderful example from Catherine Gillespie's book, The Cow with Ear Tag 1389, uh, which you know, I highly recommend reading, and um, where uh, Francis Gillespie talks about Sadie, a cow that is now at um, an animal sanctuary. So let's just you know, read that together. I met Sadie, a cow formerly used for dairy at Animal Place in 2012. She had come to the sanctuary after being used for first for milk production on a large scale dairy farm and then by university agricultural science program as a teaching tool. By the time she reached the sanctuary, she had experienced the loss of multiple calves taken as part of routine dairy industry practice. She had been injured as a result of her use in the teaching program and she was fearful and distressful of humans. She was also pregnant. When she gave birth at the sanctuary, the calf was stillborn. For the first time, Sadie was allowed to spend time grooming and caring for her calf, although he was dead. She was given space and time to grieve, and the sanctuary caretakers grieved with her. When she had finished her ritual of, teach, of tending her dead calf, they buried him at the sanctuary. Following this experience, Sadie became an adoptive mother to orphan newborn calves who came to the sanctuary. She transformed her grief and loss into a practice of care and love. Shortly after I met Sadie, she died at Animal Place, the sanctuary community, along with tens of thousands of supporters around the world, mourned her loss. So just a reminder that there is another type of world that's possible for animals. And hopefully we can you know, change the legal system to help us get there. Thank you so much for your attention today and I look forward to your comments and questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Manisha. And that was a um, really moving way to end it as well. Um, we have some, some good questions from the audience and I will uh, jump right in. This one comes from Che Gossett, uh, says, uh, I totally appreciate the necessary value of shifting the register, the legal grammar and ontology from personhood to being as a more capacious category. I'm wondering two things. How might this turn be taken up in legal practice and in animal rights law and protectionism, especially given allegiances to the category of personhood? Also, can you speak to how abolition, the ongoing movement against carceral law from cages to securitized colonial borders, including animal law, uh, figure into this move towards a recognition of, recognition of rational, relationality. Yes, okay, thank you so much for those wonderful questions. Um, so first, to answer the first part about um, uh, integrating it into the practice, I'll just share that um, through the Non-Human Rights Project asked me to serve as an intervener for one of their lawsuits for, um, as you may know, Happy the Elephant in New York um, at the um, Bronx Zoo. And um, I was, you know, in the position of then writing uh, a brief and an amicus curiae brief, trying to take the principles of beingness and apply them to Happy's case rather than putting it in the language of personhood. So the outcome that you know I was seeking and others are seeking, and, and I'm not sure if the court will has accepted it yet. Um, so uh, uh, I just want to make that clear. But in terms of what other interveners have argued um, for the, the litigation and uh, what the Non-Human Rights Project itself is arguing for Happy, the outcome is the same to you know have her come out of the zoo and, and go to um, sanctuary. Um, but the argumentation about why is, is you know, slightly to somewhat different, I would say, in different parts of that brief. So I try to focus not on kind of um, the intelligence of elephants or um, you know, uh, Happy's ability, for example, to pass a mirror test um, as to why then the law should see her differently or kind of be woken up to her needs, but her embodiment, her relationality, and just our ongoing vulnerability um, as uh, a reason why. So if we think of personhood, yeah, there's longstanding allegiance um, uh, to this, but is that necessarily a benefit? That's not clear either, right? Because you know we are speaking um, when we kind of advocate for change to primarily individual judges or individual lawmakers, policymakers, 
who are kind of embedded in an anthropocentric mindset, who are, who are not going to be as disposed to thinking perhaps as animals as equivalent to humans for all intents and purposes. And so personhood is um, a category that is going to make someone think, oh, you're saying animals are just like persons. And maybe that is you know, what we believe, but that may not be what everyone else believes and actually be a bar to legal personhood. And let's face it, right? There's been a lot of personal cases for animals, but none that have really been successful on a systemic level um, for, for kind of changing the register, so to speak. So there may be more practical legal traction in talking about a different term and talking about animals differently. Um, it would still, of course, be radicals. I don't think anyone is going to think otherwise hearing those arguments, um, you know, radical in, in quotation marks. Um, but law is about language, right? And even the common law is just about, we see things certain way and then someone says, oh, no, it's a little bit different. And the next case says, oh, we can extend it over here. And then all of a sudden, you know, a few years down the road, we have a case that takes a completely dissenting viewpoint and makes it the majority. And this is all about the words we use and, and what they come to signal. So personhood is no different. And if you look at the scholarship, it's really an elusive concept. So um, we can continue to work with it, but there's no magic in that word. Uh, and there may even be some detriments, as I just said. We can start like a new discourse for animals because law is just about kind of you know language and persuasion. On the second argument, yes, thank you for that question. It helps me, you know, rem reminds me to clarify. The, the book is not about, you know, putting in criminal um, prohibitions and then like um, putting people in jail because they violated them. It is, uh, you know, so uh, um, I am aware of like kind of the concerns about the carceral system and, and what's wrong with it and not to promote that. So the, nothing in the book is meant to um, increase the level of incarceration of human beings. Um, it really is trying to get at systemic industries to, to just you know, eliminate them and change the business as usual model. Um, so let's hope that uh, you know, there is no positive correlation between the book and kind of increased incarceration. Great. Um, and the second question comes from an anonymous attendee. It says, please expand on your definition of corporate trade in animals and does this extend to animals as food? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for that question. Yes, it does. Uh, it extends. So if we think of what is called by some as the animal industrial complex, that would be the animal agricultural system, which, you know, is a behemoth of like, uh, you know, processing animals into commodities. So very much it would extend uh, to animal agriculture, animal aquaculture, um, uh, uh, commercial fishing, all of that, that basically sees animals just as resources, um, to profit from um, because people want to eat them. And so those industries under a beingness model wouldn't be able to do that because the legal protection of beingness is that animals are protected in and of themselves. Um, their embodiment, their relationality, their vulnerability is attended to. That means they cannot be um, exploited for other industries, even for food. Great. Um and this question comes from Max Bezman at the business school. He says, from a practical standpoint, where should we focus our effort over the next five years? What do you, what pieces are doable, do you think? Um, if I take that, thank you, Max, for that question. If I take that question in terms of like um, actual practices uh, and the kind of prohibition thereof, um, I think, yeah, that will kind of be different in different jurisdictions, but so again, I'll go back to the BC example. Like, I don't think anyone two years ago thought that mink farming would ever be banned in anywhere in Canada, or even that there might be legislation coming forward in Canada where, I mean, the fur trade is such an, a part of the kind of nas national history story that is told, um, banning uh, kind of fur farming. And um, so I think it's a matter of figuring out kind of, you know, the pulse of every type of legal jurisdiction and obviously who's in the corridors of power, whether it's the ju judges, but also the legislators and getting at those particular issues. Um, so obviously issues around companion animals would be 
very doable and feasible. Um, but really, you know, quantity wise, we really need to think of the animals that are seen as the food animals and the farmed animal systems. And so, I mean, we have the most recent IPCC report just at the end of February saying again, you know, governments have to act, they need to do something um, or the, the window is, is closing. Now, of course, that's an anthropocentrically kind of motivated report about, um, you know, the, the perils to humans. Um, at the same time, uh, there is some traction to be made if we can relate things to climate change, um, or even hopefully people understanding the links more between animal kind of um, containment systems for food and zoonotic diseases. Um, so I think universities have a much greater role to play than we have been playing. Um, just think of our own catering systems and dining and residence dining and um, there is a default veg movement that is gaining traction in some countries, which would, you know, kind of accommodates the need to do something that will make a big difference and do it fast, um, if not for animals, at least for the climate, as well as, you know, works with the social psychology of humans that it's really hard to change what we eat at after, you know, it's a certain age because it's so entrenched and correlated with uh, gender and other identities. So something like that in the default badge in the university system and sort of a default badge is a system where you just change all the menus um, and reverse the current default, which is animal-based products to plant-based products, right? And uh, it's still giving people a choice of what they want to do, um, but it makes it easier, right? It's kind of like all the nudge theory. It makes it easier to nudge better uh, ethical behavior uh, than we might otherwise choose. So that is something very feasible to legislate that, right, or to act for that, because it still about allows, it's not a complete ban, but it's transitioning to a different type of system for multiple reasons, whether it's animal suffering, climate change, chronic human health issues in the first world, um, or zoonotic uh, pandemics or global uh, food security. Great. Uh this question comes from uh, one of our fellows, Jan Dukovic. He says, in moving toward the goal, your first point after Francione of ending institutional instrumental animal use, what role do you see for consumer focused efforts like public education or even alternative protein, given that so much of the human animal interactions is given that so much human animal actions are mediated through the food industry? Yeah, so I think the question is, what can we do in terms of public education and, and consumer grassroots activism? Well, yeah, just what role do you see for those like consumer focused efforts like education or ton of proteins or, you know, given that so much happens through the food industry? Yeah, no, I see a really big role, right? I mean, um, one of the departure points that I didn't review at the, in the slides, but is in the book is that, you know, law can only do so much. Um, I guess those of us who've gone through law school are going through law school, kind of, you know, get inculcated to norm thinking that it's the end all be all kind of a savior for everything, but it can really only do so much. You need the wider cultural change and sometimes, all, you know, propels that and sometimes reflects that. Um, and so, yeah. A uh, short answer would be there is a great role. My own writing has focused on really, I'm thinking um, is that there needs to be better, greater intervention, especially because of the food habits that get so entrenched and are difficult to shift it as adults because they correlate with our sense of ourselves, our families, our cultures, our, our gender identity is to reach human children as early as possible with different education model. So, you know, Many human children, many human cultures get the message from parents, schools, media uh, about dominating animals. And this actually, you know, I would argue goes against um, kind of the kind of empathy that can be there for animals. It kind of gets adulted out of them. Um, and we understand that there's a human performance and part of that is to, to, to dominate animals. So you want to just be seen to be like this proper rational subject. So the more we can get interventions in the public school system, um, just in kind of, you know, uh, films or documentaries that, or, or, you know, TV shows that children watch, or, you know, books that adults, you know, read to them, um, uh, I think would be something to really uh, zero in on because it has that um, potential of making 
really wide scale change and creating a new public, you know, in a generation or so that has a different way of seeing things. Again, we have seen social change and the effect that different curricula in school has on different social issues and social understanding, right? And so they're hard fought contests over what children should be exposed to. And so it's not gonna be easy because it's gonna be adults fighting about this, obviously. So we still have to work with adults, but um, making inroads on the food system is, is, is a longer term project. And I think getting to children who then become the leaders uh, and consumers of tomorrow um, for their families um, or themselves is really important. Great. Uh, we actually have another question from another one of our fellows, uh, Jeffrey Skopek. Uh, he says, it, it seems that your conception of what it means to be a legal person tracks traditional conceptions of what it means to be human, but legal scholars know that person and human are not the same. There are two key points of difference. First, a legal person can lack core human traits, including rationality, sentience, etc. Think of ships, corporation, etc. Uh, second, a legal person can have very few rights at all. So it seems to me that it is really not radical to extend personhood to all animals and thus that a new category is not needed. Can't the problems you identify with legal personhood be remedied by developing a better understanding of legal personhood? Um, maybe, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't wanna express like 100% I know that personhood is wrong, but what I argue in the book is like, it's unlikely and there's an, Okay, what, and just to review, why is it unlikely? Again, drawing on um, personhood scholarship that others have conducted, we see that the rationalist vision of personhood, despite the fact that corporations, as you know, have been persons for centuries now in many jurisdictions, uh, that the rationalist person, vision of personhood uh, is influential even with respect to corporate rights, most kind of you know, fully developed in the um, United States in terms of uh, rights for corporations. And so um, where we have personhood in test case litigation, like the non-human rights project litigation or other types of litigation, asking for personhood for animals kind of under the same theory of, you know, anyone the law says is a person can be a person. It's not such a carte blanche as to what the arguments are. Invariably, you get arguments about intelligence and that being really important or like mirror tests and cognitive levels. And so the personhood arguments strategically, right, we can understand, even though we might want to include all animals who are never going to be seen as humanizable, invariably go to this species of animals can do X, Y, Z, just like other categories of persons, right? And it's not just, it's not really saying this species of animals is like a corporation. They're an empty vessel, let them in. It's typically this species of animal can do X, Y, Z like you. It just, these animals get humanized very quickly. And again, I want to recognize the suffering of the humanized animals. I don't wanna dismiss that for a moment and that these campaigns are important. At the same time, which animals are they going to reach? So personhood may be viable and helpful. Yeah, for some animals, but my concern is that it doesn't seem like it's going to reach the animals that we don't see as human or not, you know, meeting the human benchmarks. And so what, especially the animals we eat, because, you know, we tell ourselves stories that, oh, no, they can't. They're not smart. They're not intelligent. Um, there's nothing going on there. They're just, you know, whatever, a low, dumb animal I, uh, that I can't I have a right to eat them. Um, so how can the law get to these animals? Um, will it be through personhood? That's why I say, no, I don't think so. Um, and in any case, personhood hasn't shown to be kind of an easy pathway for animals right now. So perhaps it's time to kind of take a pause from personhood and think about other ways of advocating for animals, other stories we can tell legal decision makers like um, which I tried to do in my own brief about happy uh, that is not kind of putting the premium on what the cognitive status of the animal is or what the intelligence status is, but talking about embodiment, relationality and just general vulnerability. Great. Um, uh, 
one last question here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, would you please explain how you see disembodiment as a defining character of personhood or otherwise clarify your definition of disembodiment? Sure. Um, thank you again for the question. Yeah, so disembodiment um, is meant to be um, a term that connotes that the law doesn't normally uh, talk about the body or value the body when we think about who the person is, uh, who a, a legal person is and why someone gets to be a legal person. So it's this idea that we are all of just of our minds. That's what matters. And we even don't see reasoning as a mind body process, um, you know, as certain neuroscientists have encouraged us to do. So uh, that's what I meant by disembodiment, just a general position that who we are, what our social identities might be because of our body status and how society um, uh, kind of sees us, let's say, for example, as gendered agents, is not really important to the legal person. Great. And, and one last question. Uh, this, this viewer asks, I would like, wants to make sure the ending of captivity of whales and dolphin, dolphins act, has that, that's yet to be enacted, correct? No, it is an it was it was enacted in 2019. Great. There are loopholes, there are grandfathering provisions, but yeah, it is there for and there's actually a current lawsuit now of you know um, one of the the um, entertainment parks not even respecting what the law says. Yeah, but yeah, it's there. Wonderful. Well, on behalf of uh, Professor Kristen Still and myself and the uh, Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School, thank you so much for uh, spending this time with us today and helping uh, educate us all about your wonderful book and uh, the work that you're doing. So it's, it's an honor to have you here and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you again, Kristen and everyone at the program. And thank you for um, your attendance today and all the wonderful questions. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.